So today we're talking about a philanthropic attitude. It's the last of the talks exploring a wealth revelation. Now I don't know what you think about when I say philanthropic philanthropy, but I wanted to give you a little history. Historians generally agree that the word was coined in ancient Greece by the playwright who wrote Prometheus Bound. The author told as a myth how the primitive creatures that were created to be human first had no knowledge, skills, or culture of any kind, so they lived in caves in the dark and in constant fear for their lives. Now Zeus, the king of gods, decided, huh, I'm going to destroy them, but Prometheus, who was a titan whose name meant forethought, out of his philanthropos tropos, or humanity-loving character, gave them two empowering, life-enhancing gifts. The first of which was fire, and fire symbolized all knowledge, skills, technology, arts, and science. And he also gave them blind hope, or optimism. The two went together, because with fire, humans could be optimistic, and with optimism, they could use fire constructively to improve the human condition. Now the new word, philanthropos, combined two words, philos, philos, loving, in the sense of benefiting, caring for, and nourishing, and anthropos, which means human being, in the sense of humanity or humanness. Now at that mythical point in time, human individuality didn't exist because there was no culture, including language, skills, and other differentiating attitudes or attributes. But what Prometheus evidently loved, therefore, was not individual humans or groups of individuals, but humanity as a kind of being, a human potential, what these proto-humans could become with fire and with blind hope. The two gifts, in effect, completed the creation of humankind as a distinctly civilized being. So philanthropia, loving what it is to be human, was thought to be the key to an essence of civilization. Now these two gifts in the 21st century could be termed the two interdependent qualities that form the nature of God uh, and the action of God recreating itself as its creation. And that would be love leading the way through the law of mind. Now, intelligence and heart is inbred in us. I'm sure you all agree, it's our birthright. And philanthropy, therefore, is really our DNA. Now we have to increase our awareness of this truth by consciously uniting the two together by a philanthropic attitude. Now, when I thought about philanthropy, and I, I love the word because hmm, I get the greatest joy when I just give. And I'm sure you all can relate to that. And I get even more joyful when I don't think about what I'm going to give, to whom I'm going to give, when I'm going to give it, how much I'm going to give, just when it's spontaneous, it's off the cuff, on the fly. Isn't that fun? I love that. And um, they say in our teaching that God or love is spontaneous. Because when we live in an infinite universe, and know that the universal law of abundance is always in operation through our circulation of giving and receiving, then we know that we can't run out of anything. But often we feel short, shy, and um, empty. So I don't think to be uh, have a philanthropic attitude and lead from that in life has anything to do with um, being endowed with a great bank account. I think that if we just believe that we are enough just because we exist, we would own a deeper capacity to share the blessing that we are. I know that we often think we don't have anything of value to give. 
But you know, we have been born with an infinite source, um, along with the inherent capacity to give or express ourselves fully or selflessly. The trick is not being attached to the outcome of our giving. So, um, if you're new in this community, play along, because this community likes uh, to turn to somebody and have a little chat. So, I'm going to ask you a question that will give you a basis of the chat, hopefully. If you decide to talk about the last great restaurant you were at, go for that too. But, but what I'm going to ask you is this. Where in your life are you predisposed to practice a philanthropic attitude? So that means kind of like spontaneously giving in joy without thinking about anything else, just giving. Where in your life are you predisposed? Because, you know, we are in some areas and not in other areas. And you know what those are. So turn to somebody, take a minute or two and, and say hi and tell that person something really, really uh, significant about your life and get to know them. See, so you had a lot more to say than you thought you did. So I want to share a story with you um, that speaks of the nature of things. Two monks were washing their bowls in the river when they noticed a scorpion that was drowning in the water. One monk immediately scooped it up and set it on the bank. And now in the process of doing that, he was stung. He went back to washing his bowl, and again the scorpion fell in while the monk saved the scorpion and was stung again. The other monk asked him, friend, why do you continue to save the scorpion when you know it's its nature to sting? To which he replied, because to save it is my nature. Yeah. You know, to give selflessly really is our nature. Because when you do that, you are being authentic, you're in the moment, you're present with life, that's all our nature. We have the capacity, we're not distracted by the shiny things, to do that and be that. We all have that same nature, it manifests differently. And often that difference can be witnessed by the many different takes on what we think love looks like and how we choose to love. Meister Eckhart said, I never give thanks to God for loving me because he can't help himself. <laughs> Whether he would or would not, it's his nature to. Now we're doing a course right now called Spiritual Economics, you know, um, the book of a similar title by Eric Butterworth. And Eric says, <coughs> I chose something that was in chapters that the students hadn't read yet. Um, it says, um, gratitude is not for God. Now this is interesting. Gratitude is not for God. We are not obligated to thank God for our life, for our job, for our prosperity. Well, that might be a little hard to hear, or a little challenging to hear. However, giving thanks is an important state of our consciousness that keeps us in the awareness of the divine flow. God doesn't need our thanks, because God is us. It's right here. So it's important how we mindfully choose to build our consciousness. Uh, for some, you might look at that as Christ consciousness. How do we build that? We do give thanks, but we're not giving it to anybody. If we want to thank anybody, Thank ourselves for breathing, for showing up, for living, for making choices that allow us the opportunity to contemplate and choose who we are going to be in this world. Now we can't uh, enter into a conversation about a philanthropic attitude without addressing the law of reciprocity, which really is just giving and taking in our life. Now I was thinking about this. Um, last night, and it dawned on me that we really didn't earn anything in life that really sustains us, uh, or makes us feel good. We didn't earn it, because those things 
that make us feel good and sustain us are things like air and water, the sun, uh, the earth's provisional food supply, our birth. We didn't earn any of that. It was just given, naturally, through the nature of that which created us. Yet, we strive to amass provisions, professions. Um, uh, we increase, we use it to increase sometimes the illusion of our status or security or power. And in doing so, we, we end up embracing exactly what we're trying to get away from by virtue of doing that, which is the illusion of scarcity. Instead of just believing in abundance, and that makes us live lives sometimes of a sense of superiority, entitlement, separateness from others. We start seeing the different levels of, um, of humanity, and we go, I'm not that. I'm not that. And it's always one of these, either I'm this, or it's I'm this. You know, it's never ah. There go I. So when we don't feel secure, and we're not attached or attached, uh, connected with, I should say, to that abundant nature that is us, we go looking to get rather than to give. I'm going to share a story with you called Three Grapefruits. And it, I share this story because it illustrates um, being in the natural divine flow of the union between mind and heart through a philanthropic attitude. So the three grapefruits is a story about one small act of giving that can have enormous repercussions in an interconnected world. Now it's written by Tai Tetsu Uno just before his family left Japan in 1968 to continue their six-year sojourn. A friend from California came to visit the family and brought them three grapefruits. Now at that time, um, there were import restrictions, which made fruits from abroad ridiculously expensive, going for several thousand yen in fact, which is I think equivalent to about $20 a grapefruit. Now since the Tai Tetsu family was soon traveling to California where the fruits are plentiful, they decided to give them away to his wife's a uh, flower arranging teacher, and thought nothing more of it. Now, several days later, they received a brushed letter expressing gratitude for the three grapefruits. The first grapefruit she gave to her grandchildren, who were thrilled with the fragrance and taste of an exotic fruit they had never seen before. The second grapefruit she peeled and ate together with an old friend whom she hadn't seen for 20 years. And the third grapefruit she took to a hospital where her best friend was dying of a terminal illness. She hadn't eaten for more than a week, but when she saw the fruit, she wanted to taste it. Just a little piece. When she finished the first mor morsel, she went on to eat half the grapefruit, and her loved ones watched with tears of happiness that she was enjoying something. The, teacher, uh, the teacher's letter once again thanked the family profusely for the grapefruits. And the Tai Tetsu thought, uh, family thought after reading the letter, well, just thank the grapefruits. But then they remembered what, what uh, Buddhists said about one small act of giving. So in the Buddhist tradition, one small act of giving is said to be equal to countless acts of giving. No one can measure the effects of a single act of giving, for its repercussions are beyond our limited imagination. Now, one small act of giving is often referred to as dana parmita. Now, in dana parmita, we are made aware of three kinds of purity. Now, this means that true giving involves the awareness of this. One, that there is no giver. Two, that there is no gift. And three, that there is no receiver. I think that equals or spells no attachment. And I think it also can make you feel that when you give selflessly, unconditionally, selflessly, 
in the moment. You don't think of yourself. You don't think of really what you're giving. It's not a planned thing. You're not prepared. And you don't necessarily think who you want to give it to based on who you think might deserve it or based on maybe who you want to get closer to, which is how I used to give. I had a hidden agenda. Wasn't always aware of it, in my defense, but oftentimes I was. I wanted something back from what I chose to give. And so I chose when to give, what to give, how to give, and to whom to give for my greatest return. Now, I'm not ashamed of that because I was aware of it. I became aware of it. And then I chose to change it. And I chose to practice different ways of giving. And my favorite, as I said initially, which I saw a lot of people doing this, is spontaneous life, right? Without any thought, because it feels good. It's, it's the joy, it's the joy of life. It's the circle, right? Of giving and receiving, the law of circulation. Now, the true act of Dada Paramita, or one act of small giving, involves, and this is interesting, giving up what we cherish most, which ultimately is often our ego self. We just can't live without it, and we shouldn't. But sometimes it just speaks a little too loudly. Because it's through our perceptions of ego, which I call also our personality self, that we create and affirm we are not enough. So basically, one true small act of giving, where you have no thought of the giver, the gift, or the receiver, actually asks you to give up your not enoughness. Now, intellectually, that doesn't seem like a very hard thing to do. Everyone was, yeah, I want to do that. Hmm. There's a teacher I know who encourages uh, the practice of Dana Par Paramita with her children. Um, uh, just to give you an example, I remember him telling me that he took his students uh, to give fruits, another fruit story, to the homeless. And in doing so, he went out and he, he purchased the most expensive fruits at the grocery store. And uh, some of the mothers came along, you know, just to watch this exercise unfold. And one of the mothers came up to him and, and said, um, actually complained, if I remember him telling me the story so long ago, that the homeless um, didn't deserve such extravagance. And he explained two important things about true giving. First, it requires some sacrifice on the part of the giver, which means to give away something that one doesn't need is not dana, it's not a true act of giving. So in that sense, to spend an exorbitant amount on the best fruits possible was more of a sacrifice, because he could have bought the cheap fruit. Second, the act must not be condescending, which often we do when we feel we do charitable acts, which is not true giving. Because right? we have a, a judgment in, in charitable acts, often we do. Um, it must show respect to the one who receives the gift. In fact, I remember him telling me that he ended up this beautiful practice and that this experiment with his children to say, one is grateful to the recipient who makes the act of giving possible. So you can see how much uh, more closely that works with the three uh, purities. So some of the questions we might ask ourselves to become aware of our capacity towards true giving or one act of simple giving are these, who am I to give and receive from without any expectation? Do I ever perceive selfish motivations in people who give to me? Do I feel indebtedness to those who give to me? Do I feel resentment at being asked 
to give? Do I have past experiences that might affect the way I give and receive today? And one of my personal favorites, have I encountered opportunities to give, but I've held back? Someone once asked Gandhi, why do you give so much? Why do you serve all these people? And surprisingly he answered, I don't give to anyone. I do it for myself. The aim and the fruit of our dana practice is twofold. We give to help and free others, and we give to help and free ourselves. Um, the Tibetans have a practice to cultivate generosity. I can't do this and hold the mic at the same time. Can you hold it? They take a potato and they just move it back and forth between two hands. I used to juggle this as well, that was <laughs> And the idea was to let go easily and to receive easily. Let go, receive, give, take, give, take, or give, receive. And you can use the word take for receive. Sometimes that's a harder word. I don't want to be known as a taker. I want to be known as a giver, right? But this is what they used to do. This is kind of a fun practice. You could breathe. Breathe on the intake, the, recept the receiving, and breathe out the giving and let it go. A little story about the potato. It's a side note. I thought, what do they have? What do they have um, back in the, the, um, the times of Greece back then? They, they have potatoes, right? Or, and uh, I, they didn't have a potato at Joel's house, so I took an egg. I thought, well, that looks like a potato. I thought, maybe I should bring a lemon. And then I thought, no. And then I walk in here, and there's a bag of open potatoes. So, uh, how, do, how, do, how are we provided for? Do you know? Um, so I, I like to live uh, in the idea of just giving full circle because we know it always works. The law of circulation is always working. Um, the universe is reciprocal. We put our ideas into it. It spits our ideas back out in our experience, right? Because everything is mind, one mind. We think with the one mind. We think into the one mind. We think as the one mind, the mind of God. So... I'm going to close with a, a beautiful story of a retired Zen master. I feel like telling stories today for some reason. Um, retired Zen master shares that where he lived in Hawaii, the land was traditionally divided in pie-shaped parcels. Now, you may be familiar with this idea. And they extend from a point in the mountaintop all the way down um, the tops of two ridges that bound to the valley and to the sea. So they flow down. And some people forage for herbs and harvest uh, timber for houses and canoes. Um, they do construction in the highest levels, and others grow taro and vegetables lower down by the water, and still others fish in the sea. Um, they, they give the products of their labor to their neighbors and to everyone. Um, they're foresters, they're farmers, they're fishermen. They had what they needed to live creative lives. And I think if we look at our own lives, as if everything has already been given, the supply is there. It's all laid out at our feet. All we need to do is accept it by accepting that we are enough, meaning that we are divine in our humanity. And then we can act in a manner of allowing this beautiful, infinite source of supply of whatever it may show up in its tangible form, go. We can just let it go, knowing that it has a rippling effect. And knowing that as we empty the glass, right, what happens? It can spill. God does not like a void because God is all there is. And there's an infinite supply. So we can't run out of anything. So I think it's a, a beautiful idea, this uh, dana paramita, this act of beautiful self-givingness. So it's not just about things that you give. In fact, 
if you do that, maybe reconsider next time. That, that hug, that love, that listening to somebody. And I know this is not new information to you. But we do forget. We do forget how much we are valued, how much we are loved, how much we are love and are of value to the world around us. So I think I'm going to end with that. Um, you know, Holmes says, Dr. Ernest Holmes, who wrote The Science of Mind and Spirit, he says, right now, today, any sequence of cause and effect may be intercepted and changed and everything made new in our lives. So let go of those old beliefs that you may have brought in here today and realize the magnificence that lives within you, right here and right now. And act in a way that you always remember Help yourself remember by the actions and the choices that you make. Blessings. And so it is. Thank you. Thank you.